um, for the next hour or so, uh, we'll have a little discussion. And, and I think that, that uh, we culturally have exactly the same chasm as we do in terms of the physics here between my helio colleagues who have been utterly baffled by, you know, the, the detailed discussions of multi-space, uh, you know, plasmas in the ISM, as maybe some of you had looking at uh, heliophysics uh, ion distribution functions. So, um, you know, we're, we're kind of different communities. I mean, culturally, there's always been a, a, quite a bit of a chasm between space physics and astrophysics, which is just entirely artificial. And certainly in the turbulence world, I mean, we all have very many, uh, many of this very same um, interests overall, and we just have slightly different applications and environments. So um, what I want to do is have a discussion today, and I, it's sort of talking about kinetic dissipation mechanisms, but it's more broadly about how do we connect these large-scale MHD simulations of turbulence, you know, on the sort of kiloparsec scales perhaps, down to, you know, what we do in uh, space physics, we're doing kinetic, like particle and cell simulations on scales ranging from, you know, uh, 10,000 kilometers down to, you know, a, a kilometer. So we want to be able to connect that. So um, what I want to really ask is, you know, how do we connect MHD simulations and kinetic simulations of plasma turbulence so we can learn from each other and improve our, our ways of doing that? So, and it's both, you know, not just going one direction, but both. How, how do we learn from the MHD simulations? What are the right conditions for our kinetic simulations, which are generally at smaller scales? And similarly, we're resolving these small weekly collisional physics um, at the small scales, and how can that feed back into informing the larger scale MHD simulations? Um, similarly, and, and you know, to get into more of a point, how do we model the kinetic damping mechanisms that can replace the fluid viscosity and resistivity in large-scale astrophysical simulations. So, uh, you know, mostly we, at, at these MHD simulations, you specify vis viscosity, specify resistivity, and then you can run your simulation, you see what you get. Um, but in, and I'll give you a bit more detail here, but in many of these environments, really the, the scales on which the dissipation of the turbulence occurs are weakly collisional. And so the, the strongly collisional approximation of MHD is not really valid. And the, the approximations for dissipation, viscosity, and resistivity are not actually applicable. So how do we make that connection and learn from that to improve our overall understanding of how turbulence evolves in space and astrophysical plasmas? So to dig a little deeper in here, I have a few slides, and I'm going to turn it over into discussion. Um, so, and I showed this slide yesterday, and I will point out, somebody asked me, where's the ISM? So I put the ISM on here, okay? <laughs> um, and the ISM is the one example where it actually probably dissipates still at fluid scales. There might be some examples where it doesn't, yeah. All right, go fluids. Yeah, okay. So I did put that there. Just as a, as a historical fact, this, this figure was, was made for a proposal originally. We were really arguing for the importance, so we didn't put the ISM on there. So <laughs> let's have full honesty and put it on there. So I'm, I'm, I'm replacing that in the paper that I wrote. Uh, so this is now the new figure. I did this last night. Anyhow, um, so, but the point about this is, and to be, to be a little bit more detailed here, is that um, Viscosity and resistivity are defined as an expansion in the mean free path or whatever your gradient scale length is, in the limit that that is small. Now, if I write the gradient scale length as 1 over k parallel, then k parallel lambda MFP, that is a measure of the importance of collision. So if it's very small, like here, that is the collisional limit. This is the fluid limit, OK? Now, the chapman enskog expansion uh, that you do to derive viscosity and resistivity from kinetic theory are only valid in the limit that that is small. So it's not even all the way up to this boundary between the yellow and the blue, the yellow being the fluid regime and the blue being the kinetic regime, but it actually fails well before that. Now, exactly where it fails and how spectacularly it fails, well, that would require 
further further research and and there are certainly you know these these cascades go right through that range so this is an open question and some of the things that um, Irina talked about looking at her observations of clusters questions just that and you know from from her point of view you know these ideas these models of isotropic viscosity just really spectacularly fail to explain the observations that they're seeing um, but these things fail, and what we really have to understand is these kinetic mechanisms that are dissipating. So uh, just to explain, each of these boxes represents the inertial range. And I, I specifically mean from the driving scale, which is the left-hand side of this bar, to the ion larmor radius scale. That's where MHD is fully broken down, and you get into this kinetic regime. So. Um, so we, we, we have this, uh, this situation here. So for each of these plasma systems, um, even though a few of them might be driven in the fluid regime, almost all of them actually dissipate in this weakly collisional regime. So it means that there's this whole host of kinetic mechanisms that actually are responsible for removing energy from the turbulence and energizing the plasmas. Now this isn't a talk, I could talk forever about this, but I will not. Um, but it, sorry, I want to do want to say one thing. But in order to characterize these, okay, we, we want to do it from a theoretical point of view, meaning that all of these processes should be able to be most uh, optimally described in, in terms of a set of dimensionless parameters. And those dimensionless parameters let us connect things like you know turbulence in galaxy clusters to turbulence in the solar wind, right? So. Um, I, I finished a paper which is enormously long, and as I've said, if you want to go to sleep, please read it because it'll probably put you to sleep. It's about 70 pages long. Um, but the point of it is to, take, to identify a set of dimensionless parameters with which you can describe all of those kinetic dissipation mechanisms in the same framework. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on all of these. There are 10 of them. It's a lot. The first five describe the nature of the plasma. The important ones I'll, I'll point out are the plasma beta, here specifically the parallel plasma beta, assuming that there can be some temperature and isotropy in the plasma, and the uh, ion to electron mean free pa or, or uh, ion to electron temperature ratio. Again, if I'm talking about the, the uh, weakly collisional range, this mean free path, these numbers are going to be large because it's going to be in that collisionless regime. Um, and then there's turbulence parameters. The first three describe the driving. And then these are just sort of the nature, whether it's compressible turbulence, whether it's imbalanced, meaning that there's more alpha and wave energy going one direction from the other, or, or wave, or any, it doesn't have to be alpha and waves, can be other kinds of waves. So in the sun, in the inner heliosphere, you get lots of alpha and wave energy going out and not much coming back. And it's those interactions between counter-propagating waves that actually drive the turbulence. That's an important parameter. Um, now, I'll, I'll, I'll point out this, this nonlinearity parameter. I want to jump to the next plot because those of you who do turbulence and MHD turbulence are saying this doesn't make any sense at all. Where's the Reynolds number, right? What, what is going on? You know, you're talking about turbulence and you haven't put a Reynolds number on that. Well, there's the reason is because here's the Reynolds number, right? The flow times the length scale over the viscosity and then the magnetic Prandtl number as well. The, the, the viscosity is of the resistivity. Why don't, why aren't those on that list? Okay. Well, they're not on that list because of what I just said earlier. They're only defined in this small mean free path limit, this collisional limit. So once you get up to the case where this is of order one or larger, those are not good descriptions of the dissipation mechanisms. So in this weakly collisional limit, it's those kinetic damping mechanisms that play a role, and they're not necessarily going to be well described by an isotropic viscosity with a Laplacian operator or an isotropic resistivity with a Laplacian operator. At the very least, in these weakly collisional systems, the viscosity and resistivity should be anisotropic because they don't respect the direction of the magnetic field. Um, so that's sort of the Braginsky version of, of these transport coefficients. But even that might not really be able, because that's still a fluid limit, just allowing for anisotropy. Um, it may not even be enough to really describe these kinetic mechanisms accurately. And so um, if, if, I, if I reduce down by making some assumptions about isotropic temperatures, there are ways of combining those various turbulent driving parameters to get one driving scale. So a, a sort of a simplified non, you know, dimensionless parameters for turbulence are these three, the ion plasma beta, assuming isotropic temperatures, ion to electron temperature ratio, and what I call the isotropic driving scale. This is really just a measure of the, uh, it's the uh, ion mean free path, or sorry, the ion larmor radius scale over the driving scale. So it's a measure of the dynamic range of the inertial range of the turbulence. 
So um, what this enormous paper that I wrote did was derived all of the scaling relations to generate this. This is uh, what I call a phase di diagram for the turbulent damping. So it tells you as a function of two of those parameters, beta and k naught rho i. This is k naught rho i, so this is rho i over the driving scale. There's a little 2 pi in there. Um, this is, it tells you where certain collisionless mechanisms are going to act to dissipate that turbulence. And, and with the exception of this thing that says viscous, but it's in quotes, and I'll explain that in a minute, there's no viscosity and there's no resistivity in this plot at all. They don't play a role in damping weakly collisional plasma turbulence. So you can have uh, Landau resonant mechanisms, Landau damping, transatine damping, stochastic ion heating, cyclotron damping, reconnection can play a role. This kinetic viscous heating is actually mediated by temperature and isotropy instabilities. Um, so what I want to do is talk about that. I always see some hands ra being raised. Great. I, I just want to open the floor now. This is the end of my introduction. I just want to lay some groundwork, and, and I hope I make some people really angry, and we can really start talking to each other about this, okay? Anna. Yep. Switch it off. No, I'm not angry. I, I just want to... <laughs> What's the connection number one and reconnection number two? Uh, number two. Ah, okay, yeah. Those are... The, <laughs> the, the, so, okay, I'll, very briefly, and this is diving into some weeds, and I apologize for those of you that, that don't care. Um, the, uh, okay, so uh, the collisionless tearing instability, which is what initiates reconnection. If you have a current sheet and it gets thin enough, the tearing instability is an instability that can, that can start to generate reconnection. Okay, that, uh, the, the calculations to determine the growth rates of that instability depend on the nature of the current sheets. N equals one is when you have a Harris-like current sheet, and again, you probably don't know what that means. It means that the magnetic field has a hyperbolic tangent profile. It's constant, it goes through zero, and it's constant. So it's like a current sheet with nothing, and everything is just constant away from it. There's one growth rate for that. N equals two is when you have a sinusoidal variation of the magnetic field. So if it varies enough in that sinusoidal change when it's going through zero, that can initiate reconnection. The growth rates for those two different cases are different from each other, and they result in different predictions for where reconnection would disrupt the turbulent cascade. It occurs when that tearing mode growth rate becomes faster than the nonlinear cascade rate of the turbulence. So if the turbulence, which we have seen plenty of, of talks, show it developing these current sheets, if those current sheets get long and, th and thin enough, the, the reconnection rate can grow fast enough that it can disrupt that turbulent cascade and do all kinds of things that are still really probably the, 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 uh, the, uh, the topic of, of ongoing research right now. Um, Anyway, so that is... Is there not also another free parameter here being Sorry. the... Is there not also another free parameter here? That, there, you, okay, that, there, that you didn't speak of, which is actually the spectral index of the turbulent cascade? That's determined by the turbulence. It's, it, I mean, that's not... I mean, the, the, the point about it, the dimensionless but, parameters is that if, if we believe that turbulence is a universal process, once you've defined those parameters, it will give you whatever the spectrum is that it gives you, and, and it shouldn't change. I mean, that is a result once you've specified the parameters. Okay, I got yeah. you. We've got lots of people moving around. Okay. So how should I connect this plot to the previous plot? Because here, if I say we are in the intracluster medium where, like, beta is 10 hundreds, so we should have kinetic viscous heating. And then on the previous slide, your intercrustal medium was basically all the way uh, like in the fully kinetic regime. So uh, uh, like if we okay. model that. Yeah, now, now we're going to get into some real details. OK, so the kinetic viscous heating is a very peculiar thing. And it's actually a really critical thing to figure out how to model, because it's the one that might really affect the, the MHD range uh, fluctuations. Um, it, is, it is not a Laplacian viscous heating. But the term that, actually, let's just do this because this is going to be easier. Um, is there a light? Yeah, there we go. Nope. <laughs> there. OK. The term that gives you viscous heating, right? I mean, or, or you know, viscosity, it's going to be a term that looks like that. 
okay? And this thing is constant. And it's a linear term. There's nothing there. This kinetic viscous heating, and it's mediated by these temperature anisotropy instabilities. When Mihailo was talking about that Brazil plot, which unfortunately was a really squished version, there are versions of that plot, they really do look like Brazil. That was not one of them. I apologize. No offense to Brazil. Brazil's a lovely place. Um, but, but the point is that um, that, that viscous heating, I'll, I'll put it uh, in quotes, I don't know. Okay, it's, it's a function of beta and the, the frequency of the waves, which is this is basically the nonlinear frequency of the fluctuations at that scale times the amplitude of that squared. So this is a nonlinear viscous heating, okay? And it really only matters when delta B over B is order one, and that's usually at the outer scale. So that viscous heating happens at the outer scale, but the minute you get into the, to the cascade a little bit, this thing dives out and it goes away. So it's nothing like the viscous heating that we normally think about, which cuts off and terminates the cascade. It actually, it, 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 can, it can pull some energy, well, I've got a, a slide for it. Um, it can pull some energy from the cascade, B? Oh, oh, did you hit? Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> um, just a second. Yeah, this is, I should have, there we go. There we go, that's good. Okay, that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, so th this is actually from uh, Lev Arzamaski's paper from last year, which is where they first sort of proposed this viscous heating. It's mediated by these temperature anisotropy instabilities. If you have any magnetic field magnitude fluctuations at the outer scale, and it doesn't necessarily require a compressible fluctuation, because if you have delta B over B, even for a linearly polarized alphane wave, it leads to magnitude variations. And if the plasma beta is high enough, at beta more than 10 probably, you can push the plasma into a regime where the temperature anisotropy is beyond the instability threshold for these kinetic anisotropy instabilities. And what they do is they actually directly tap energy from the driving scales and send it right down here to say the, the ion lumber radius scale here. It'll generate um, ion instabilities. And so you have a non-local part of the cascade. So this is one of the things that will be very tricky to try to capture in an MHD simulation. Many of the other things that are happening, um, this, is, this is when there isn't, so there's at lower beta, when this viscous heating doesn't occur, what happens is you get your, your typical picture of turbulence. You're driving it here. You've got some local cascade of energy through an inertial range. There's no loss of energy through there. I mean, that's the definition of the inertial range. You get down to the ion scales, and again, these collisionless mechanisms, what they may be, can start to remove energy here. And then it cascades down a bit further, and then it can get down to the electron scales. Eventually, probably around the electron scales, there's enough of this collisionless damping to really terminate the cascade there. Um, there's a little bit of controversy about that, but not much. Um, that's the standard picture, and of course, all of the stuff down here, which is way below, so all of your MHD simulations stop like here. I mean, they, they, they can't resolve this scale. And so you've got a whole cascade, maybe it goes many orders of magnitude up there, right? Um, but maybe it's a lot easier probably to say, well, I'm just going to say some amount of energy was lost from my MHD turbulence, and I can go ahead and and say, well, I know where it's going to go into ions or electrons depending on some of those fundamental parameters. And I can say, well, my ions get heated in the perpendicular degree of freedom, or my electrons get heated in the parallel degree of freedom with some fractions or some partitioning. Those would be a turbulent heating model informed by kinetic physics that tells you how to update the temperatures in your, in your system. Of course, as, as we know, many, many space and astrophysical especially high temperature plasma, say black hole accretion disks, they're two temperature, right? So MHD is probably already going to fail in the sense that it assumes the temperatures are the same. So you have to have differential heating rates. And, um, and the point is you, you might be able to, I will get to you in a second, Axel. Um, you might be able to say, well, I can at least have a turbulent model that tells you where that energy goes. But, and, and, and maybe that doesn't affect the larger scale dynamics other than the long uh, long time thermodynamic evolution of your plasma as the turbulent heats it, and that will be important. But this, this kinetic viscous heating is actually acting on those scales where the dynamics is actually being resolved. And so we've got to figure out how to do this and how to kind of plug that in and make it work. I, I hope that answered the question. Axel. 
Yes, what do you say makes a lot of sense. And it oh, would yeah. be nice to hear the others Sorry. talking about that. Uh, yeah. The new that you wrote on the right-hand side in quotes, do you mean by that actually new times k squared? No, this is just the new. But it, it's, well, actually, because it has yeah, a, it, it, uh, sorry, that's right. They use new as a scattering rate. Yeah, this this should actually, yeah, this should actually be new times k squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it's it's equivalently, yeah, it's sort of like this, but but it doesn't really. I mean, it, it, it's its units are one over second, right? I mean, that's what that thing is, right? So yeah, sorry, I, sh I should have said they they use new in that, and I always use new as viscosity, so it, it's a little confusing notationally. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. My my follow-up question would be like bridging the right hand side plot back to the like very first slide that you showed. Yeah. How close are we to have uh, like a model for that that we can apply into like really large scale MHD simulation, like fluid simulation from a practical point of view? Not very close. <laughs> That's the whole point of this discussion is that, I mean, this public, you know, the physics of this was really only recognized in a paper that was published last year. Elliot was actually one of the authors on that. Um, there are ways of doing it, but Elliot might, uh, might, might have a different word on that. Please. Yeah, I would say that we understand actually pretty well the regimes in which you generate these instabilities that scatter the plasma in a way that acts in certain respects like an effective viscosity. That's been implemented in global simulations of, of a range of systems, including galaxy clusters, including black hole accretion flows. So there are certainly parts of the theory that still need to be understood better, but I think the, the microphysics when, when, ingredients. When you say effective viscosity, like on that, that would be the plasma was like, some no, I mean, what one is, is actually doing is there's a, there's a dynamical variable, which is the pressure anisotropy, which is like a viscosity, right? It's the off-diagonal off components of the stress tensor. And one has to model that term, um, which does show up in the stress tensor and hence in the, in the heating. So yeah. it, that's exactly how it's done. Um, and, and the pressure on anisotropy is amplitude dependent, depending on the amplitude of the fluctuations. Yeah, and I would say the other thing that, that actually probably more important than the generation of this viscosity by the large amplitude turbulence is just the generation by bulk flows. So compressions and shearing of the plasma also generates the same kind of kind of shearing of the distribution function, and so generates this viscosity in the same way. And again, this has been included in models of clusters and models of, of accretion flows. So I think the, there are you know, reasonably physically motivated subgrid models for including that. They still have uncertainty, but, um, but I, I think it's maybe, I would say it's slightly further along okay, than, than Greg. Now, do, uh, do those include Anisotropy, I mean, are, are these diffusion coefficients anisotropic as these well? These are anisotropic diffusion, so at this, we're talking about just transport of momentum along magnetic field lines, so that's an important thing. It's not, I think this, this theory, th there is an analogous theory for unmagnetized plasmas, but those, that's really only interesting for sort of the first generation of dynamo models. Generically, astrophysical plasmas of the kind that Greg is talking about are in the limit where one cares about the transport along the field. So, so these are Braginsky models where the, the actual Braginsky viscosity and thermal conductivity depend on the macroscopic state of the plasma, like the shear, the level of turbulence, things like that. Yes. Uh, can I, can I uh, yes, comment? Absolutely. So um, uh, this is actually just a short comment. This is this is a, a viscous force. Uh, viscous dissipation would be new omega squared, new over right. I squared. mean, yeah, I just wrote it as, as the, the force. And, and about this paper, it's very interesting. So in, in 2006, we actually wrote um, something about a similar mechanism. So if you have anisotropy generated by turbulence, of course, you will generate instability as waves, then anisotropy will be limited by um, these waves themselves. Uh, so in our model, we found that 
the energy is not transferred from the driving scale, from the collisional scale. In fact, it is some intermediate scale where uh, the time scales are much shorter and therefore um, you generate, uh, you know, more energy in these waves because uh, there, there's basically a shorter time scales to pump energy into the spiral waves. And we also uh, assume that the waves are not necessarily in kinetic range. So you can generate waves on, on all scales and uh, we assume that they are in fluid range in which case they can be dissipated, for example, by steepening. But so how how are they being generated at other scales? Like what is the instability that's creating that? So so the instability is still in you know the this, the 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 general resonant uh, in instability when you have an an anisotropic distribution, uh, if it is above the threshold, it will generate uh, these waves. So so it's, it's a classic cyclotron resonance instability, um, and. It, it 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 can generate as long as as long as you are above threshold, it can generate this instability at any scale, uh, including what uh, you know initial range, uh, down to uh, uh, what you call subviscous range, because it it looks a parallel to me, and uh, the uh, the story is that with with a smaller edges and faster edges, you can generate these waves faster. And you can uh, you, you have smaller time scale, so so this is why we concluded that it's not from the outer scales that you pump energy into the smallest scales, but from some intermediate scale. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Um. Just a, a question there. I thought that those. Uh, ion cyclotron waves had a fairly narrow region of wave vector support. So why aren't they all being driven at KD, K parallel DI of, of you know, 0.3 as opposed to that, that broad range you were describing? Well, the, the, what you call iron, iron cyclotron waves in, in, the, uh, in, in the fluid regime, they become Alvin waves and slow waves. So we just consider the whole, the whole thing. It, it, they, they exist at all K. You, you can go in fluid regime, you can go to kinetic regime. And and you can still have uh, cyclotron resonance. It, it depends on the energy, of course, of the particle. Okay, I'll, I'll, you said 2006. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to take a look at that. So, I mean, if you if you use the the Vlasov-Maxwell dispersion relation and you have a sufficient temperature and isotropy and stability, I mean, the growth rates peak for the ions, if it's an ion temperature and isotropy instability, the growth rates peak at the ion long radius scale, which is why that's what's what's drawn there. So that, I mean, and I could pull up plots, but I don't have them at hand. But, but there is, you know, the approximate range, there is, uh, there is all kinds of collisional sparks. Right, I mean, there's no cost cosmic rays in this. <laughs> like, it's, 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 there. Like, if you actually look at the transfer functions for that, I mean, this is an actual simulation of that. Um, and, and just for those who have no idea what the heck this plot is, I know we've seen a couple versions of this, is that, let's say over here, like, when you have red here and blue here, it means that energy is going from here and being transferred to there. And so if, if all of the, the, the colors hug this line, it means that you have local transfer of energy. It's the Kolmogorov hypothesis that the cascade is local. It's determined by the conditions that that local K. And non-local energy transfer will mean that there's, there's colors out here. So this broad blue region, this broad, broad red region, indicates that there's energy transfer you know, from, say, this scale. It's, it's being transferred to all of these different scales. Or from this scale, there's energy transfer. Now, I don't want to dig into the details of the blue and the red and all of that. That's, that's really going way too far in the weeds. But the point is that if you do this with a lot of, of you know, sort of MHD turbulence simulations, although I'm sure some people stand up and tell me that I'm wrong, uh, you know, most of the colors just hug that line. But when these temperature and isotropy instabilities kick off, you start to get this, which indicates transfer from whatever scale you're at here down to this broad range of scales. Fair enough. As I said, somebody will tell me I'm wrong. I knew it. <laughs> 
So, so I can ask another question is, you know, for MHD modelers, people are doing these large scale things, like what, what are the kind of things that, that you need in order to improve your simulations? And, you know, what is the, what are the kind of conditions that you can provide? So, you know, as I said, I tried to cast this all in terms of, of dimensionless parameters, things like plasma betas and so forth, so that you can take a, a particular condition and say, okay, this is, this is what happens in this, in this case. So I'd also like to sort of open up the, the floor to, to that. Did you want to say something, Axel? Where'd the mic go? There it is. Can I ask one question before we move on? Do you yeah. actually form a power loss spectra in that type of non-local uh, energy transfer? Because I feel like you're yeah, not. More or less. I, I can't, I mean, I didn't put the plots on yeah, my slides, but, unfortunately. I mean, but, if you're just taking all energy from one point and putting it to the other, well, it's, it's like you're depleting build the scales. It's not all, it's a fraction. Yeah. Elliot, do you want to? <laughs> what? what we need? A drop, strong drop in the power spectrum at the largest scales where the amplitudes are large because those are the fluctuations that are directly driving the kinetic instabilities. The energy that makes it past that point is then basically unaffected by the kinetic instabilities and looks like a, a standard you know, cascade with a power loss spectrum, so. Yeah, yeah, so this process, oops, let's go back here. Yeah, I mean, this process is gonna take some of the energy out there and transfer it, but then whatever energy has not been tapped is gonna go down there, and I think that's a very much an open question of what is that partitioning of energy at those large scales and one that would be very, very relevant to large scale MHD modeling. Actually. Regarding now the question what we need for MHD, I yes. mean, we certainly not somehow need to first of all know whether it actually connects at all. Is there a smooth connect between MHD and kinetic theory and has that ever been checked or verified? Uh, but then we also need, of course, something like a, a prescription, what to do with the energy at small length scales. In the MHD description or fluid description, we have a cascade which is local. Um, and at some point, we need to add a prescription to remove that energy. So what's the prescription? Right, okay, so, so I mean, this is not about, this is more about the heating at the small scales, not about that viscous, you know, tapping of energy at the large scales. But I mean, this is something that I did back in 2010 and nobody noticed for about four or five years. Um, the, uh, and so it, it's a model, and it's, and again, in, some, in terms of those parameters I showed earlier, I mean, it's, it's limited, it's, you know, large dynamic range of the inertial range, strong turbulent driving. This, this is effectively a combination of the anisotropy and the, uh, the, the Mach number, so it's, it's, a, it's a measure of the strength of the driving, the nonlinearity parameter, if you're familiar with, like, goldreich Schriedar. Um, and then no compressibility and balanced turbulence. Um, and, and so it's, it's a cascade model, and so it's an analytical model that says, well, energy is cascading down, and some of it's being pulled out by linear damping, and I'm assuming that all of the damping is via the Landau resonance, so it's Landau and transit time damping, and I could probably go back to the other phase diagram. And, and what you get is a partitioning, um, and I have to put this down, because you have lost half of it. So, I mean, that's, that's the model. <laughs> that's the model. And so it depends on beta and temperature ratio. And if you have those numbers, you plug it in. And so if you know what the energy being pulled out, the, the heating rate, what's dissipating in your, in, your, in your MHD simulation via whatever mechanism, whether you put in a viscosity or it's just numerical diffusivity, if you're, if you're tracking that, then you can use this to split it up into ions and electrons. It's a very zeroth order model for trying to do this. And the interesting thing is it's a very strong function of plasma beta. Um, so it goes from very small values at low beta, although this is a bit unrealistic for reasons that are not worth talking about right now. And then it, and it goes up and sort of saturates at high beta. Um, but the temperature ratio going from 0.2 to 100, these curves don't change very much. And so the, the, the numerical model that I did to generate this is the black lines. Uh, yeah, the black lines. And then the, 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 the actual this formula here is those red lines. So it's just fitting what those are. And actually, uh, the blue lines are from Elliot Quadrat's uh, 99 paper with Andre Gruzinov, where he predicted what the, the heating rates would be as a function of beta and temperature ratio. Um, 
So, so you can do that, and they've actually sort of more or less verified, at least quantitatively, this using a suite of hybrid gyrokinetic simulations, which is a very good comparison point because Landau and transit time damping are going to be the dominant mechanisms there, although reconnection could play a role. Um, and, and you more or less see the same kind of features, very weak dependence on temperature ratio and, and this quite strong dependence on the, uh, the plasma beta. There's a little bit of quantitative difference about exactly where this saturates here and how low it gets down there. But we actually understand why those disagree. Yeah. And just as a, a plug for uh, some work a grad student has been doing, uh, Waverly Gorman has a paper that should be on archive hopefully by the end of the week, uh, where we've added to this model by uh, looking at some corrections for high beta environments, which will be particularly important for the astrophysical context, where the alpha waves begin to behave in a particularly interesting way at high beta, and we had to do some corrections that basically change, if you go back a slide, uh, those uh, parameters in right your C1, C2, C3, and P are slightly different. Uh, and lead to a slight suppression of the proton heating at those high beta values. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the Q ratios here, uh, is that actually an input uh, to the kinematic kinetic model or is an output? The, this is the output. So, so, means, so what it's saying is okay. that if you have an MHD code, yes. I mean, this is hopefully this is helpful to people that yes. are thinking about trying to do this in MHD codes. If you have an MHD code, you need to tell me locally where you're finding, I mean, it's, and it might depend on the local position. If you can measure the plasma beta, and now you might not have a temperature ratio, but, but if you're doing this and you're doing alternate heating, you're going to have to track different, uh, different plasma temperatures, right? So you might have to add a scalar field so you have an ion electron temperature. You can combine them you know, to do your general MHD evolution, but of course, in, in, in principle, this should be too fluid. Um, but if you can tell me what the, the ion beta and the temperature ratio at that point where you're losing some energy, then you use this to update how it changes the temperatures. Mm. And so, yes, these are the inputs that your code would give, give you. You just plug this into your simulation. And so locally, whenever you see that you've lost energy, you can assign the heating according to that, that uh, ion to electron temperature ratio. And, and just as a, as a curious point, if you want to know why it might matter, this, these are, pardon me, <coughs> general relativistic MHD simulations of Sagittarius A star, um, which were done, well, quite a few years ago. Um, and, and they did this both with uh, this heating model that I just showed you, as well as a different model, which is based on, on the physics of transrelativistic reconnection, uh, where the ions are non-relativistic and the electrons can, can be all the way up to ultra-relativistic. Um, and these are, are predicted observational signatures, the emission from that object that you might see with the Event Horizon Telescope. And what you see is a, a very dramatic difference. This is a linear scale, this is a log scale, so it really emphasizes small details. But you get a really big difference there. So if you want to interpret astronomical observations in terms of the results from your, if you're doing a global simulation and you really want to say, what are the features, where is it hot, where is it cold, and I know that that's a, a big interest of the people in this room, um, these, these models make a big difference. They really do. And so being able to get better models, improve them, incorporate more physics is, I think, a, a, you know, that's my goal personally. And, and my other goal of being here is to, to reacquaint myself because I've been running in astrophysical circles for a while. Um, but find out from you guys, how can I better connect with you so that we can do exactly what my first question was, how do we connect the MHD in the kinetic worlds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, James. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you just mentioned reconnection, and this kind of um, brought up some thoughts. Um, what do you think about the reconnection-mediated cascades that are yet to be determined, even in the fluid world? How, how does that fit into this picture? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it, it seems clear to me, certainly from, you know, Vladimir Zhidankin and, and Luca, I don't know if he's in the room right now, but, oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, you know, they've done some, some phenomenally great Relativistic. Now, mind you, my model was was formally non-relativistic, although I think you can push it pretty far. Um, they've done some phenomenal relativistic pick simulations where they see clearly that magnetic reconnection is playing a role, is 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 arising, and it actually leads to some some particle acceleration. So, one thing I've been talking about plasma heat, and of course, we had some excellent talks this morning about acceleration of particles in turbulence, uh, you know, that's another channel where energy can go. So, and, and I, I'm not trying to say that it doesn't happen, it's just yet one more complication in this picture. 
but um, they've shown some, some excellent simulations where that occurs in turbulence. Um, in, in, in a lot of other turbulence simulations, you don't see as much reconnection. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I'd say is it's that an open question. Is that because of these dimensions parameters? Like, is, it, is there some region in the parameter space you've defined that, oh, okay, I see, reconnection <laughs> well, one. here's my parameter space. Getting back to the, I mean, this is why I think gotcha. this is a helpful thing. Yep. And look, this is zeroth order based pretty much entirely on analytical theory. Mm -hmm. And so we need to test this with simulations. Of course, they've got to be kinetic simulations if you want to test this. Um, I mean, there certainly can happen in the, in the collisional world as well. In MHD, you could have that as well. But the point is that, um, and, and I, I just, I, I was going to say this earlier and I didn't, is that how would you use this, this phase diagram here? Well, if I say this is the solar wind and the range of parameters in plasma beta runs from sort of 10 to about a little less than 0.1. Um, and then, you know, the range of driving scales is about three to four orders of magnitude from the driving scale of the turbulence at one AU down to the ion, ion alarm radius. It's this gray box. So I would say, well, the turbulence should either dissipate due to Landau and transit time damping, these blue curves, because they sort of cover this whole range, and at lower beta, possibly some stochastic ion heating as well. So you would do that. Now, this is, of course, just a very roughly qualitative thing, but at least gives you a picture of where those mechanisms are going to play a role. Now, again, based on analytical theory, and there's lots of, you know, numbers, is it number one, is it 0.3, and is it 0.3 to the ninth power, which is actually why these curves get down here so far. Um, the, uh, the, you know, these curves are there, and the reconnection will happen in two ways. You either go to low beta, or you go to very large dynamic range, which gives you much more elongated current sheets. So, you know, again, this is a this is an analytical prediction, and I mean, you know, nobody's doing simulations over you know seven orders of magnitude. So there's there's certainly a, a computational challenge here. But um, but and you know, and if you do like turbulent reconnection, like we saw this morning, maybe there's different ways of initiating reconnection under other parameter uh, parameter regimes. And in the in the uh, relativistic case, it seems to be quite different, especially when it comes to reconnection. Yeah, Sasha. Uh, so this is all extremely useful and exciting. Uh, it kind of brings the whole picture together, at least for me. Uh, so I'm curious. You have regions where, like, several effects overlap, um, like uh, you know, let's say beta ten to the minus three and uh, uh, ten to the minus seven for the vertical axis. So yep. you have a uh, reconnection of two kinds, you have uh, electron Landau and transient time thing, and you have stochastic heating. So what do I do there? Do I just add up all the three different models? But obviously I can't do that. So how, how, how do you combine them? That is a great question. You're just, I, I should pay you. Um, <laughs> okay, so sure. so yeah, I mean, this this is the challenge, right? This is the challenge is that so far, and the reason why I wrote this paper and why I really worked hard to get it done before this meeting was um, because, because thus far, pretty much all of these different mechanisms have been looked at in isolation. With one exception, there's one model by Ben Chandran in 2011 that includes the electron and ion land damping and the stochastic heating. And of course, he was focusing on, on, on heliosphere and solar wind, so that's a, a, a good place to look. But almost every paper is really only looking at one of those mechanisms. And, and, and a, a, a really you know, cutting edge question is, if two mechanisms are acting, how do they compete? What is the partitioning of energy in those? And of course, we're going to have to do that in a, in a statistical sense. I mean, it might vary a bit, but you know, if you choose parameters of you know beta 10 to the minus two, and you're at you know 10 to the minus three, well, you'll get some maybe some cyclotron damping, maybe maybe some stochastic heating, maybe some electron Landau damping. It it's not clear, and that's where the kinetic simulations are really going to have to uh, play a role. But I, I I try to look at this as as the roadmap for what research we need to do to be able to answer exactly the question you have. And ultimately, what I would say is is there there are two things you'd want to come out of that is I when I had those cues, you know, the, the ion or electron heating. I mean, you'd have a cue due to Landau damping and a cue due to stochastic ion heating or something like that. Those will be different ratios, and you've got to figure out for a given parameter uh, regime, you know, how does it partition in there? And I mean, you know, of course, it's impossible to draw that on a, on a two-dimensional diagram. And all these are really the thresholds where those things actually kick off. Um, 
but but of course they you know they have different rates and so those are going to depend but but the point is we want to understand how do each of those mechanisms depend again on those fundamental parameters how do they scale so that as you push from one direction or another you see how oh as i go from one regime you know i'm dominated by landau damping as i move to lower beta suddenly becomes dominated by stochastic heating and there's going to be some various scalings associated with that and they they, they may or may not interfere with each other too i, I it's again a question I don't know, but that is a fantastic question, Trevor. Right. So I guess how do you know that the model? I'm closer to the oh, mic. So how do you know that the model, the right combination of models, is actually physically accurate? You know, that's uh, okay. Um, yeah. So how do I? So so there's some brute force things you can do here, right? I can do a kinetic simulation, and I can say, oh look, I see. Ion heating, electron heating, perpendicular or parallel, I can just measure that. But it doesn't actually tell me what did it, right? I mean, I, 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 those of you who actually do kinetic things and look at dissipation, it's a very hard, hard problem to try to figure out what mechanism was responsible. You've really got to dig into the, to the plasma physics to figure out what's going on. So part of the reason why I've revisited this, because I, you know, that other model was, was 14 years ago. It was a long time ago. And it's not that I didn't want to do more, although nobody cared at the time. Um, but, uh, but that I didn't know how to answer that question. But uh, Chris Klein and I have worked on a, a, a technique to actually be able to answer that question about how you identify the different mechanisms. And so um, let me find the slide. Where is it? Okay. This is, there's a lot on this slide. Um, so this is the, called the field particle correlation technique, and this is not a colloquium about this, so I'm, I'm not going to go into uh, in too much detail here, but the point about this is, is that you can take measurements of, of the electromagnetic fields at a single point in space, okay? So electric field and magnetic field as a function of time. And then the other thing you need is the 3D velocity distribution functions of the particles, be it ions or electrons, okay? So this is why those of you who are like, what are we even looking at when we showed distribution functions earlier? That's why we care, okay? If you take those two things measured at a single point in space over some period of time, and why do I care about one single point in space? Because a lot of spacecraft, we only have one. It will be nice to have nine, but we can just do it nine times. That's great. But we have one, we can do it, and you can plug it into, you know, the middle of a pick simulation and stay in a region, I can do this. And you, you put together that, it's effectively the term in the Vlasov equation that defines, well, it's the Vlasov equation times one half mb squared, that defines how the phase space energy density changes due to work by the electric field. This is underlying in kinetic physics how particles get heated or accelerated. Okay, and you do that as a function of velocity space. So if you integrate over that, it's just j dot e, and we all know j dot e, that's how you're doing the rate of work done on the plasma. But you unroll it in velocity space and you get what we call a velocity space signature. And so each of these different mechanisms, and I'm sorry, I have a bunch of, 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 of uh, abbreviations here. So this is Landau damping, transit time damping, magnetic pumping, uh, more Landau damping, cyclotron damping. This one has three things, stochastic ion heating, cyclotron damping, and transit time damping, electron Landau damping, cyclotron damping, reconnection. Okay, they all look different, and I know some of these things might look a bit the same, but if you actually look quantitatively, they're in different places. And I'll, I'll highlight one thing here, which is actually this one here. This is from a, a Pegasus simulation from Matt Coons and Lev Um It's actually integrated over the entire domain, but you could do this locally, but you actually see the evidence for three different mechanisms in one place. So this peak down here is actually stochastic ion heating. This one here is cyclotron damping. This one here is transit time damping. And so if I, if I uh, as I said, if I integrate over all of this, it gives me J dot E. But if I integrate over just this region, it'll give me the J dot E associated with stochastic heating. So I can separate those things out. But there's a lot of physics knowledge that has to go in to be able to do this. And we're actually working on trying to develop machine learning models that can actually identify these and do this in an automatic fashion. because. Boy, we'll have really unhappy grad students if we make them do this by hand. Um, but, but the really cool thing about this is, you know, I mean, these, all of these things here are, well, and this one here too, those are all turbulent simulations of one sort or another. Some particle in cell, some gyrokinetic simulations, some, uh, this one is actually a, a Vlasov uh, simulation. 
these two are spacecraft data. So this is evidence for electron Landau damping happening in uh, using magnetospheric multiscale uh, measurements of turbulence in the Earth's magnetosheath. And this is actually evidence of ion cyclotron damping occurring in Earth's turbulent magnetosheath. So you can actually do this in space. So, you know, the idea is that in order to fill out that diagram and understand how much, it, you know, how is the dissipation being partitioned among one mechanism or another, you can use this kind of a technique to say, look, I can take these measurements, measurements I can actually make. Now, mind you, this requires in situ measurements. I can't do this with remote astronomical observations. But with in situ measurements, I can do this, and I can distinguish the different mechanisms and integrating over the net transfer in certain regions determine how much one mechanism is contributing to the total energization at that point in space. And you do that over enough, you do it with lots, you know, hundreds of, of numerical simulations, maybe, you know, years of spacecraft observations, you might be able to build up enough statistics to generate vastly improved models of that turbulent heating, not only verified by simulations, but even by spacecraft observations. Yeah, Axel. Uh, when we talked about connecting it with M MHD, you, uh, we came to the point that we actually needed a two-fluid model. Oh, needed a what? Needed Sorry. A two fluid. Two fluid. Two fluid yeah. Yeah. So that means we uh, would first of all need to connect a, a kinetic theory with a two fluid model, with ions and electrons, and then we need to connect that with MHD. Well, I, I, I think to lowest order, like even just a standard MHD model, right? I mean, the MHD approximation is strongly collisional. Energy is, is shared between ions and electrons. There are isotropic velocity distributions underlying it. The ions and electrons have the same temperature. That's all fine. But if, if depending on exactly what your, your variables that you evolve in your, in your simulation are, you, you probably have one variable for temperature, right? And if you just split that, create another scalar variable, and so now you have an ion temperature and electron temperature, right? You can track those separately, but you know, when it comes to the equations of evolution, you don't even really need to do the two fluid thing. You just add them up and get the total temperature. But only, right? the, the only difference is that we have magnetic energies and kinetic energies in MHD. Well, no, that, but this is what I'm saying is, wait, well, you've got to have some thermal energy, right? I mean, um, you know, do, in, in, I mean, in you have an adiabatic it, equation of state, you've got to have some term, I mean, so unless you're doing isothermal, right? You've got to evolve the temperature. But in weakly compressible turbulence, there's no temperature. Okay, I'm really confused by that statement. Do you have something to say, Ethan? I was just going to say, I think you referred to sort of some science. Can you? Yeah. Right, right, but, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I think if you're, ooh, okay. Does this work? Yes, yes okay. I, I, I think we're talking past each other. I, I think all Axel is saying is if you're talking about slow motions, um, you can have a different equation of state, but that just refers to different sound speeds, very slight compressibility. It really, the whole thing just drops out. You might as well be incompressible. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, you know, one can always take limits, right? right. You know, but, but if the physics you're interested in is how much more are the electrons heated than the ions, then your model better allow you to track that, right? And so whether you use a full two fluid model where you're actually uh, following both the different scales of the ions and the electrons and everything else, but I, I certainly can imagine that you could mock up a sort of an MHD code where you just track, and I know that this is actually done, there's a, a code from the University of Michigan for global heliospheric modeling called AWS, it's like awesome, yeah, it's it's a Alphane Wave Solar something model. I don't know. I can't remember the the acronym, but it is a, is a global MHD model for modeling the the, the sun, the solar corona, and, and and into the heliosphere. And even though it's an MHD model, they track the both the perpendicular and parallel ion temperatures independently, and they track the electron temperature separately. And so they certainly have built that in, and they actually use the Chandran. Uh, heating model which separates perpendicular and parallel ion heating and then electron heating. So it's sort of like uh, well built for that. So, so you can do it and it's just a matter of deciding what is the physics you're looking for 
And you know, if you if you want to do isothermal and you're just looking for very large scale broad things, then you know you, you don't have that information. But you've got to choose the model for the for the target you're looking for. But but uh, yes. I think Axel has this point because, uh, as a matter of fact, when you talk about um, temperature and isotropy between ions and electrons, at the end of the day, you were really um, uh, let's say yeah, you were talking about uh, an, an isotropy. And we can always have this, for instance, also in the collision-less MEGD approach when we have a, a, a tensor distribution, right? Absolutely, but yeah. When we have to go from the, the, the collision of scales down to the kinetic scales, yeah. in the kinetic scales there are also approximations because you may either have um, electron-positron plasma or electron proton plasma, and you have to make assumptions about the mass ratio between these two particles, right? Because otherwise you you, you have trouble in solving these scales, I mean, numerically. Absolutely. So, uh, still it's very hard to, to, to do this transition, uh, you know, using first principles, right? But I, I think uh, you have a point when you say, okay, we should separate the temperature, let's say, the, 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 the two components, two fluid components, in order to get closer to, to the uh, kinetic scales uh, because of this separation that we do have in, in kinetic scales, in unavoidable separation between protons and electrons, right? Right, right. I mean, I mean, I think, it, you know, if you, you know, and again, this is, you know, there are varying levels of approximation. I mean, if you, if you want to capture, you know, the, the temperature and isotropy instabilities that might lead to that viscous heating that we started this discussion with, right? You've got to, you've got to follow the temperature and isotropy, which means that you've got to have a sort of a collisionless MHD model that evolves the perp and parallel temperatures independently, because of course, totally independent of any kinetic physics, right? Um, then your equation of state has got to be a double adiabatic equation of state, CGL, right? So that if you compress in one direction, you increase the T perp, compress in the other, or in the other direction, you increase T parallel, and those can trigger these instabilities. So, you know, you, you've got to have a model that at least contains enough of the physics that you can make connections. So that's actually a good point that I didn't think about, is that if you want to build in this, you know, the idea of this kinetic viscous heating, which depends on the temperature anisotropy, you've got to track that. That, otherwise, you're, you're going to get lost there. So, so it, it certainly requires a bit of a more, more detailed approach. But, but again, you, one can still do that in a fluid manner, and maybe you've just got to have twice as many variables, a few more equations to evolve. And it doesn't necessarily mean you need to go down to the kinetic scales, but at least a, a, a sort of a, a anisotropic temperature with separate ion and electron temperature, MHC, would enable you to at least capture some of these. So there might be a minimum level of fluid description that we need to really make a good connection to uh, to kinetic models, and that's a great point, yeah, Sasha. Uh, so, could you go back to your uh, beautiful diagram? Yeah. Oh. oh. All right, I did a lot of things. There we go. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I think that at the beginning we were wondering. I think there was a the question: um, Does this care about the way we drive turbulence? Uh, like it has to, right? Like if there is more compre compre com uh, compressible driving uh, versus uh, solenoidal driving, yeah, exactly. But like, is, yeah. this, is this part of the diagram? So no, this diagram. <laughs> okay, this diagram. I assume that there was no compressible driving. So if you want to tie in compressible driving, that that's that's effectively another dimension. I mean, you know. The horrendous thing that one might have to deal with is that 10-dimensional parameter space in general. And we really don't want to, we're not going to get anywhere trying to start with that, right? So we start with the simplest thing. But if you're in a case where you believe that the compressible nature of the fluctuations is critical, then you've got to add that in as an extra variable. And in fact, that's been done recently by Kawazura and Shekuchin recently where they've driven gyrokinetic simulations with slow magnetosonic compressible fluctuations and they found that the ion to electron 
uh, heating rate associated with those slow magnesonic fluctuations is actually proportional to the ion to electron heating rate that you get out of it. So there are ways of, of tacking on other dimensions here. And so this is, this is zero order. And I didn't, you know, didn't want to go into great things. I mean, this is assuming a lot of things. Um, but it's still also including a lot of things, which I don't think anybody's any really done before. Yeah, Anna. Is this assuming that Mach number is small? Yes. Uh, Alphane, Mach. Yeah. And the question was, is this assuming the Mach number is small? Yeah. yeah um, For posterity. <laughs> yeah, Anna. I'm not sure if I will regret this, but... Um, oh, please. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I wanted to, to follow up on this because it, it seems to me that this community cares about cares a lot about uh, compressibility at least in some some cases. Huh? Right. Um, so I guess one of the hidden points of my last slides is that well, um, for if that's the case, I guess you know you don't need to heat the small scales to have kinetic effects and like I guess the the the, the problem might. It might be more complex than just patching large scales MHD, and then you know you assume that the kinetic stuff happens at small scales, because uh, you can have kinetic effects at MHD, MHD scales, uh, generation of ion acoustic modes that undergo some form of what? Sorry, I heard laughing. Um, Outside. <laughs> so. Um, it's more like an overlapping of models rather than a sequence of models. And I mean, I know that's daunting and I don't, know, I don't have an answer, but I guess that it might be, you know, if you're interested in compressibility, it might be um, complicated. Yeah. Well, we're, we're getting to the end. Yes, sauce. Sorry, can I ask for a clarifying question? Um, do you mean that we need to have a feedback from small scales and large scales? No. Or you mean that the what we call small scales can actually be large scales? No, what I mean is that you don't need small scales to have kinetic effects. You can have kinetic effects at MHD scales, just that MHD doesn't capture it. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing, oh yeah, go ahead, please, Omar. Oh, you need the mic. Go to the mic. <laughs> Just wondering how your comment connects to the compressibility question. Yeah, so it connects. It connects because an example is compressible fluctuations, ion acoustic modes. Um, and so ion acoustic modes uh, can undergo strong uh, uh, kinetic damping, for example. Uh, the trigger, you know, phase uh, face space filamentation that ultimately causes the heating from a kinetic perspective. So I'll, I'll give another example from Irina's beautiful observations of clusters. Those observations actually go through what we interpret to be the mean free path scale. So going from on you know, this plot, you know, going from the fluid scales, so there's the inner cluster, going from the fluid scales down into these kinetic scales, okay? So as you go through that transition, um, you're going from a transition from fluid to kinetic. Now, you know, the, the ion larmor radius scale is way over here. So what, what I've been saying is kinetic is, is really there are still collisionless effects at those large scales. And as you go through that transition at, at the, the mean free path scale, you can get significant uh, basically ion viscosity in some sense that will damp out some fraction of those fluctuations. And this is exactly what Arena was saying, that you know, the simple like uh, vis viscosity models fail to predict what she actually observes. And so I, I think it's still an open question theoretically of how to describe that and how to treat that. But this is what I would consider a fluid scale problem to some degree as you go through that transition, is that you might lose some of that energy and it's gonna go into heating something and, and we, we wanna be able to solve that problem and answer that question and better be able to reproduce what Irina is observing in galaxy clusters. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting in this plot is the intracluster medium is, the intercellular medium is embedded inside of the intracluster medium. So the whole picture of this collisional fluid cascade into the kinetic cascade is probably the opposite here, right? You have a... Well, th this, this all has to do with the temperatures. Okay. 
because intracluster medium has very high temperatures. Intercellular medium has very low temperatures. Yes, and yes. So, I understand, so the collisionality is a strong function of the temperature. Yep, and so I, I get it, that. it moves you, even though the scales are different, right? These are dimensionless scales mm. of, of that relative to that mean free path and that. So, so things kind of move around in a weird way. This is like a particular projection of that based on plasma parameters. Yes, yeah. but my point was that the simple picture that you have an MHD cascade into a kinetic cascade may not exist. This is exactly opposite, right? You have a, a weakly collisional plasma that has a collisional plasma inside of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, but yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And I really don't know how to answer that question. So on that note, I, thank you, everybody. I hope that this was interesting, at least. I feel like I've talked way too much. But, um, but at least a lot of people ask questions. That's good. Um, Thank you. Look, I'm really interested in, in uh, you know, any feedback people have about any of the stuff that I'm talking about. I haven't actually submitted this paper yet. I just finished writing it. I wanted some feedback from people. I hope that this can be useful to people, both in, in thinking about how they can extend fluid models to be a bit more, uh, for a bit more fidelity to the underlying uh, plasma physics that's going on. And so, um, you know, uh, please contact me anytime, and I really hope that in the in the coming years we can develop models and work with you guys to develop things that we can get even better physics models of these astrophysical systems that we've seen some fantastic results at this at this meeting. So thank you very much. Uh, we are particularly thankful uh, to Greg for not only chairing the session but also chairing himself. Yeah. Uh, during the discussion. So let's give another round of applause yeah. to Greg. Thank you. <laughs>